All right, so buckle up because today, um, today we're diving into a question that's both mind boggling and strangely familiar. What if our reality is actually a super sophisticated simulation, kind of like in the Matrix? It's a question that's captivated thinkers, really, for centuries. Even Elon Musk thinks there's a good chance we're not in base reality. So get ready, because today we're going deep on the simulation argument and exploring some wild scientific research that might just make you question everything. That's right. This idea has captivated thinkers for centuries, like you said. But what's really exciting now is we have philosophers like Nick Bostrom and actual scientists digging into this possibility, not just as a thought experiment, but as a potentially testable hypothesis. Okay, let's unpack this. Bostrom's 2003 paper is kind of the jumping off point for a lot of modern discussions about simulation theory, right? Exactly. He presents this idea called the simulation argument. And at its heart is a trilemma. A trilemma. Yeah. Three possibilities, one of which must be true. Sounds intense. Break it down for me. Okay, so the first part of the trilemma says that civilizations like ours probably tend to go extinct before they develop the technology to create these hyper-realistic simulations. Okay. The second part says even if we reach that level of technology, we might just not be interested in simulating our ancestors. Okay, so the first one is we wipe ourselves out. The second one is we get bored with playing God. Right. What's the third? And the third is the kicker. It says that we are almost certainly already living in a simulation. We're already the Sims. It's kind of a bleak outlook, isn't it? Maybe not. Think about it this way. If it is possible to create a simulation as detailed as our world, and there are tons of advanced civilizations out there, wouldn't it be statistically improbable that we're the original? So the more simulations that are out there, the less likely it is that we hit the jackpot and we're born into base reality. That's pretty wild. But what would it actually take to build a simulation like that? I mean, talk yeah. about computing power. Well, Bostrom did some back of the napkin calculations based on the technology that we understand today. And get this, he figured a computer the size of a planet could simulate all of human history using less than a millionth of its processing power for a single second. That's So like, you know, if you initially think there's a 10% chance of rain, but then you see dark clouds rolling in, you update that percentage based on the new information. Got it. His analysis suggests that based on what we know right now, the odds are pretty close to 50-50, a coin toss between base reality and simulation. A coin toss, that's both terrifying and exciting. But Kipping also found something really interesting about the moment we create a conscious simulation ourselves, right? Yeah, he argues that if we humans manage to create a simulation populated with beings we would consider conscious, it dramatically shifts the odds in favor of us being simulated. Wait, so if we become the simulators, it becomes more likely that we're living in a simulation ourselves. Why is that? Well, think of it this way. If we can prove it's possible to create a conscious being within this simulation, it suddenly becomes much more plausible that someone or something has already done the same to us. It's like a feedback loop. Our creation of a simulation increases the probability that we're in one ourselves. Whoa. That's yeah. a pretty heavy concept. Okay, so let's say for a moment that we are living in a simulation. Would there be any way to know for sure? Are there any glitches in the matrix we could look for? That's where it gets really fascinating. Some scientists believe that a simulation, especially one as complex as our universe, might have limitations in its processing power. You mean like a video game having to cut corners to render a massive open world? Exactly and those shortcuts might lead to detectable signatures. One intriguing area to look is in quantum physics, particularly something called the double slit experiment. Okay, I vaguely remember that from high school physics. Something about light acting like both a wave and a particle. Right. <laughs> Imagine you're playing that open world video game again. The game doesn't need to render everything in the world all at once, just what you can see on your screen. Right. Human Awadi, a computational mathematician at Caltech, thinks the universe might work the same way. He uses the double slit experiment as an example. I'm intrigued. Tell me more. How could the double slit experiment reveal a simulated reality? Well, in this experiment, you fire particles at a barrier with two slits. Now, what's weird is that the particles seem to act like waves, creating an interference pattern, even though they pass through one slit at a time. But here's the kicker. The very act of observing them seems to collapse their wave function, making them act like particles again. So how does this relate to simulations? Awadi suggests that if we're in a simulation with limited processing power, this collapse of the wave function might only happen when we're actually looking at it. 
Kind of like how a video game only renders what you're currently looking at to save processing power. So the simulation wouldn't bother calculating the full quantum weirdness until we're looking. Kind of like a cosmic efficiency trick. Exactly. Of course, Awadi acknowledges that this is just a theory, but it's a fascinating possibility, isn't it? It really makes you think. But are there other areas where these processing shortcuts might show up? Well, Zora Davuti, a physicist at the University of Maryland, believes we might find clues in the way we simulate the strong nuclear force. Okay, back up a second. Remind me what the strong force does again. It's one of the four fundamental forces in nature, and it's what holds the nucleus of an atom together. Think of it as the glue that binds quarks together to form protons and neutrons. Right. So how does simulating this force relate to the simulation hypothesis? Well, simulating the strong force is incredibly complex, even for our most powerful computers. Just like video game developers, physicists have to use shortcuts to make these simulations work. So what kind of shortcuts are we talking about? They often treat space-time as discrete, like a grid, rather than continuous, which it is in reality. Devotee suggests that if our reality is a simulation, it's possible the simulators are using similar shortcuts. Ah, so if our reality is running on a cosmic computer program, they might be using the same tricks we use to simplify complex calculations. But could we actually detect these shortcuts? Devuti believes we might see signs of this grid-like space-time in the arrival directions of high-energy cosmic rays. Hold on, how do cosmic rays fit into all of this? Well, if space-time is actually a grid, these cosmic rays might show a preference for certain directions in the sky. It would be like finding a pattern in the way the cosmic rays are aligned, hinting at an underlying grid structure. So if we see a bunch of cosmic rays coming from one specific direction, it could be a sign that we're in a giant cosmic video game. That's one way to think about it. Of course, it's not definitive proof, but it's a fascinating avenue for exploration, don't you think? Absolutely. But before we get too carried away with the idea of cosmic rays as evidence, let's take a step back and consider a more grounded perspective. Remember Occam's razor? Ah, uh, yes. The principle, the, the simplest explanation is usually the best. Right. And from that perspective, the simulation hypothesis might seem a little overly complicated. It's true. The idea of nested realities, beings who can't tell they're simulated, it's a lot to wrap your head around. Yeah. Some argue that until we have more concrete evidence, the idea that we're simply living in base reality is the more likely explanation. But as with all things in science, more research is needed. And that's what makes this whole discussion so captivating. Before we go any further down this rabbit hole, let's shift gears a bit and delve into some groundbreaking research from Melvin Vopson about the nature of information itself. This one's really gonna make you question the fabric of reality. Okay, so we've been talking about some pretty mind-bending ways to potentially detect a simulation, like looking for glitches in quantum physics or patterns in cosmic rays. Now let's dive into something completely different, the nature of information itself. Enter Dr. Melvin Vopson, a researcher who's exploring the idea that information might be the fundamental building block of reality. Vopson's work is fascinating. He's proposing that information is not just something we create or transmit, but an intrinsic property of the universe, kind of woven into the very fabric of existence. Okay, I'm all ears. I love when things get a little meta. So is he saying that the universe is like a giant computer and everything is just data? Not exactly. He's not saying that the universe is a computer, but rather that information itself might be a fundamental component of reality, just like matter and energy. He calls this information physics. Okay, so information as a fundamental building block of reality. How does that even work? Well, think about DNA for a second. It stores a vast amount of information that determines everything about a living organism. Bobson proposes that every particle in the universe, even the tiniest ones, might store information about itself in a similar way. So instead of just having properties like mass and charge, particles also have an information component that defines what they are. Right. That's a pretty wild concept. How does this tie back into the simulation hypothesis? One of Vopson's key findings is something he calls the second law of infodynamics. It states that entropy, which is a measure of disorder, actually tends to decrease in information systems over time. Wait, isn't entropy supposed to always increase? Like, my desk always gets messier if I don't actively tidy it up. That's true for most physical systems, yes. But Vopson suggests that information systems operate a little differently. They tend toward order, toward the decrease in entropy. So it's like the universe is constantly tidying up its information. That's a pretty cool image. What does that have to do with simulations? 
Imagine you're a programmer working on a simulation. To make it run efficiently, you'd want to optimize your code, right? Get rid of unnecessary bits and streamline everything. Bobson sees this decrease in entropy in the universe as evidence of something similar, a kind of cosmic optimization process. So he's saying that this natural tendency toward order in information systems could be a sign that we're living in a giant optimized computer program. That's one way to interpret it, yeah. yeah. If our reality is fundamentally made of information, and information tends towards order, it suggests that there might be an underlying mechanism governing that process, potentially something akin to a computer program. Okay, that is seriously mind-blowing. It's like the universe is constantly defragmenting its hard drive. But even if Vopsin is right, how would we ever know for sure if this optimization is the work of a cosmic programmer or just a natural law of the universe? That's the challenge, isn't it? Vopsin's research raises more questions than it answers. It's a fascinating avenue for future exploration, but we're still a long way from proving or disproving the simulation hypothesis. All right, so let's bring this back to our listener. What are the key takeaways from all these different approaches to detecting a simulation? I think what's important to remember is that even if we can't definitively prove or disprove the simulation hypothesis right now, the very act of exploring it forces us to confront some really big questions about the nature of reality, consciousness, and our place in the universe. Right. It's like even if we don't find the smoking gun that proves we're living in a simulation, the journey itself expands our understanding of the world in some pretty profound ways. Exactly. And that's what makes this whole discussion so valuable. It pushes us to think beyond our everyday assumptions and consider possibilities that might seem outlandish at first, but have the potential to completely reshape our understanding of existence. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We've explored Bostrom's trilemma, looked at potential signs of a simulation in quantum physics and cosmic rays, and even delved into the mind-bending idea that information itself might be the fundamental building block of reality. But what about the bigger picture? What's truly fascinating to me is that even without definitive proof, the mere possibility of living in a simulation raises some incredibly profound philosophical questions. Yeah, like what does it even mean to be real if we're just lines of code in someone else's program? Does it change how we think about free will, the meaning of life, morality, all that big picture stuff? Precisely. It forces us to confront the possibility that our perceived reality might be just one layer in a much larger, more complex structure. So, like, maybe our simulators are themselves simulated and so on, creating this infinite chain of realities nested within reality. Exactly. Boscombe calls this idea a naturalistic theogony, and it's a truly mind-boggling concept. Okay, I need a moment to process all of this. But before we spiral too far down that rabbit hole, let's talk about the ethical implications of potentially living in a simulation. If our actions are being observed and potentially judged by beings at a higher level of reality, does that change how we should live our lives? Hmm. Well, that's a really interesting question. But you know what? I think we're going to have to save that for another deep dive. I agree. It looks like we're just about out of time for today. But before we go, I want to leave our listeners with one final thought to ponder. We've been talking a lot about the potential for a simulated reality, but what if it's not just about the external world? What do you mean? Well, what if the simulation hypothesis also applies to our internal world? Our thoughts, our feelings, our very consciousness? What if those are also part of a grand simulation? Whoa, now that's a head spinner. You're yeah. talking about simulating consciousness itself. Exactly. If it's possible to simulate the physical universe, why not the inner world of the mind as well? Think about how far AI has come already. We have machines that can learn, adapt, even create art and music. Is it so far-fetched to imagine a future where consciousness itself could be simulated? I mean, it's definitely pushing the boundaries of what we currently understand. But hey, that's what this show is all about, right? Exploring the big, mind-bending questions. Exactly. So for all of you out there listening, here's your homework. Ponder this. If your consciousness is part of a simulation, what does that mean for your sense of self, your free will, your very existence? And if you come up with any answers, let us know. We'd love to hear your thoughts. You can find us on all the usual social media platforms. Just search for The Deep Dive. And as always, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep diving deep. Okay, so we've explored this idea of potentially living in a simulation from all angles. The philosophical arguments, the potential scientific evidence, even the mind-bending concept of information is the fabric of reality. But where does it all leave us? It feels like we've opened up this huge can of worms and there's no easy way to put them back in. 
I think that's the beauty of it, isn't it? These big questions, they don't always have neat and tidy answers. Yeah. But wrestling with them, exploring the different perspectives, that's where the real value lies. So even if we never find definitive proof that we're in a simulation, the journey of exploring the idea is worthwhile in itself. Absolutely. It challenges our assumptions, encourages us to think critically, and maybe even opens our minds to new possibilities we wouldn't have considered otherwise. For our listener who's been on this wild ride with us today, what's the one thing you want them to walk away pondering? I think the most profound question, even more so than whether we're in a simulation or not, is this. If the nature of reality itself is uncertain, how does that shape the way you choose to live your life? Wow, that's a really powerful question. Makes you think about your values, your purpose, what truly matters in the grand scheme of things. Exactly. It invites us to consider our place in the universe, whether it's base reality or a layer within a much grander simulation. It's almost like, regardless of whether we're lines of code or not, we still have the power to make choices, to create meaning, to impact the world around us, however that world is defined. That's a beautiful way to put it. And perhaps that's the ultimate takeaway from exploring the simulation hypothesis. It reminds us that even in the face of profound uncertainty, the power of choice, of agency, still resides within us. Well said. I think we've given our listener plenty to ponder today. Maybe they'll even look at those everyday glitches a little differently now. You know, like when your phone freezes or the internet goes out, you'd be like, is this a simulation error? Perhaps. But remember, just because the toast landed butterside down doesn't mean we're in a simulation. Or does it? Okay, I think we're going to leave it right there before we spiral into another existential crisis. If you enjoyed this deep dive into simulation theory, be sure to check out the show notes for links to all the research we discussed today. And as always, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep diving deep.